Work is as inevitable for most of us as, well, those other inevitables, death and taxes. And sometime in the last few decades, the conversation about work turned to the idea that it should be rewarding and even a source of happiness. That is, if your employer is doing it right. What's behind that notion? And is it really your boss's job to worry about making you happy? With us now to consider that in Berkeley, California, Emiliana Simon Thomas, Science Director of the Greater Good Science Center at the University of California, Berkeley. And here in our studio, David Zweig, Associate Professor of Organizational Behavior and HR Management and Chair of the Department of Management at U of T Scarborough. Tara Henley, journalist and author of the forthcoming book, Lean Out, a meditation on the madness of modern life. And Stephen Cardwell, founder and principal at Stephen Cardwell Recruitment. And we are delighted to welcome you three here in our studio and Emiliana on the left coast of the United States of America. We're happy to have you on our program tonight as well. I'm going to ask our director, Sheldon Osmond, off the top here to give us a shot so we can see everybody. There we go. Okay. By a show of hands, everybody, who is happy in their job? Hands up. One, two, three, four. <laughs> everybody. Okay. Well, we're off to a flying start here. That's good. Uh, okay. I'm putting my hand up, too. Producer Leanne Kotler prompted me in my ear saying, what about you? <laughs> yes. As am I. Tara, a few years ago, you were happy in your work, right? Yes. And then... You stepped away. What happened? I did step away. So for me, um, I was experiencing quite a bit of burnout. I was dealing with some health problems. I started having, I'm a journalist, I started having chest pains in the newsroom and my doctor compelled me to step away. And so during the time that I was away from the workforce, I started thinking a lot about how we organize work now, the systemic pressures on work and on the individual. And I began to think about this as, as a bigger picture issue. What is everybody experiencing at work and how does that tie into to the big issues of our age? What do you think was not working for you at the time that may have contributed to what you were feeling in your chest? Well, definitely overwork. Mm -hmm. uh, I think like most professionals, I work very long hours and I'm very dedicated to my job and I love my job. But we also know that working long hours does take a toll on individuals, on families, on communities and on health. And so, um, I think there's a lot of factors at play and a lot of factors to look into when it comes to that. Was your employer nice? My employer is fantastic, yes. So that was not the issue? No, no, it was not. Okay. However, fair to say there are lots of people out there who don't have the stamina to match their enthusiasm for the job? Exactly, exactly. And I think the expectations on workers have changed so much, especially in the last decade since smartphones became a big part mm. of all of our lives. Bane we're, of our existence. We're really always on, and, and that does take a toll. Emiliana, let me get you into this discussion. You've recently written about fulfillment at work, and your opening salvo is, where you grew up, work sucked. <laughs> Why the notion that work is supposed to be somehow happy and fulfilling and all of those other things? Well, I think that humans prefer to be happy. Uh, our health is tied to how happy we are. And ultimately, if we're, we're spending our time, the many hours that we spend, up to 50% of our waking hours, if we're spending those hours unhappy, it's going to be quite difficult to actually live a happy life. Um, I just want to clarify quick what I mean by happy isn't feeling good in the moment, isn't a, a unique and, and momentary positive state. What I mean is a more general overarching quality of life that, that you would describe as looking back, I'm a happy person and, and I tend to be a happy person at work. My hunch is though that there are a whole bunch of people who are watching this who, who don't have one of those jobs that makes them happy and even beyond that, are under no expectation that they ought to be sort of happy and fulfilled at work. What would you say to them? Yeah, I mean, one of the things we can consider is what Tara said was that she realized that she was experiencing burnout. So I don't hold the employer or the organization or the company 100% responsible for making a person happy. In fact, none of the scientific evidence suggests that anyone can make anyone else happy. Mm -hmm. In fact, happiness really comes from a coordinated effort that comes both from the individual, making certain priorities, 
um, reaching out to others, in Tara's case, her physician who actually gave her good advice and good feedback, and our communities and our relationships. And all of these sort of sources of information together uh, help guide us in, in aspiring towards a happier life. It's not always about the organization providing desirable perks or special circumstances. Sometimes it's a combination of both what the organization, what the workplace really can do, what the culture's like, what the climate's like, and also what individuals bring with them when they walk in the door. Now, I do appreciate that, but let me follow up, David, with you. Is there evidence that a happy employee is a better, more productive employee? Well, the evidence is a bit mixed, and I agree with a lot of, uh, of what Emiliana said. I mean, when you asked me, uh, asked us to uh, answer the question whether we're happy at work, I raised my hand, but it's happy-ish. There are parts of my job that I, I do find happiness from, and those are the parts of the job that I find really, really meaningful. So in my role as chair of a department, it's, it's helping create really great new programs for students, ensuring they're having a great educational experience, and watching them succeed. That makes me happy. And so uh, the things that you know don't make ask, me happy, yeah, I gotta ask the other side. The things that yeah. don't make me happy are doing a lot of the administrative tasks that are, you know, come with the job are very mundane. A lot of, you know, it's bureaucracy. Those things don't make me happy. So I have to try and find the areas in my role that are that are really meaningful to me. And I think it's meaningfulness that underlies feeling happy happy at work. And that's really important. And that's what I think is uh, the organization's responsibility, but mostly a leader's responsibility to ensure that the leader can try and instill that kind of meaning into whatever job the subordinates are working on to try and make them feel like their jobs have meaning. Is there a trick to ensuring that the parts of your job that make you unhappy yeah. don't overwhelm the parts of your job that you really get the joy and fulfillment from? If I knew that, I would write a book. <laughs> and uh, No, but it is about trying to really, when you're, when you're engulfed in the, in the really boring stuff and the mundane stuff, remembering why you're doing what you're doing mm. and focusing on the, the larger picture or the larger goal, which is to focus on what is giving me meaning, what do I find important, what do I find motivating, and where do I get that satisfaction and to, to allow me to continue doing what I'm doing. Stephen, what do you do for a living? I'm a headhunter. So you match people with work? I do. Okay, when it comes to a sense of fulfillment and purpose, to what extent, and I want to talk about younger people now, to what extent do younger people and their expectations as employees match the reality of what their employers are prepared to provide? That's a good question, but it also depends on the level of the job. But with my experience in the recruitment business, we do find a lot of young people that are coming out of school, landing their first career. Um, sometimes a little bit of a reality check on how much people make, <laughs> how much things cost, which is just human nature. Uh, most of them are very good, but there are the odd few that feel that they deserve more. And in this topic, I think it comes down to both the employer and the employee to really s to step back and see where we, are, where we are today in this time. How would you gauge the difference between expectations, say, 25 years ago versus expectations today? Totally different. How so? Totally different. Well, we were taught to go to work, do the best you can, try to get up that corporate ladder. Again, depending on what type of job you have, um, maybe educate yourself, uh, take your career to the next level, and if you weren't happy, look around. Go to a different company. Leverage that way. And today? And today, well, we see a lot of uh, people not staying in jobs as long as they used to. As, as we did and maybe our parents did. Um, it's funny because that's a topic we hear all the time. We used to hear uh, employers say, this candidate's hopped around too much. And now we're hearing employers say, well, how are they getting experience if they stay at this job for six, seven, eight, ten 10 years? Emiliana, do you mm -hmm. feel it's uh, reasonable or not for younger people today to expect a level of fulfillment uh, out of their jobs that say their parents or grandparents, it never would have occurred to them to demand that from their work? I think it's absolutely reasonable. Mm -hmm. I think it's up to the younger generations to affect change and to make progress. And some of our, you know, earlier, wiser generations were actually part of a of a, of a labor system that counted on replaceability of workers, that counted on a, a more extreme hierarchical organizational structure, which actually really um, expected people to settle for working conditions that perhaps were not as fair or equitable as they could be. Um, there were also big differences in opportunity that were a function of, of your gender or your ethnic um, or cultural background. And 
all of those things are changing and the younger generation is bringing with that the expectation that you know we ought to be able to flourish in our work and our work and the time that we spend at work should be a source of our well-being not something that detracts from our well-being so I certainly welcome the progress and the change and the thinking that's going on in the younger generations around how can we together uh, figure out a way to make work something that again contributes to our sense of well-being to our happiness in life. Well Tara let me make the question uh, even more challenging. I take it that you like your occupation because mm. it is stimulating, it, mm. it is creative, you have mm. to use your brain, it, it checks all those boxes off for you. Uh, my hunch is if you worked in a coal mine, if you worked in a textile factory, if mm -hmm. you run a car assembly line, uh, you would not be a very happy person. Mm. Where do you find the joy in those kinds of jobs? I mean, that's a great question. I do think, I'm so glad Emiliana had brought up the question of working conditions because we can think about work on an individual level. We can think about work in terms of individual happiness and contentment, but I think we have to pull back and look at the larger structural issues at play here. One of which is, I mean, at, speaking of millennials, they're facing a workplace that is driven by precarious work. It's very unstable. Wages are stagnant. We know the cost of living is going up so much. So perhaps with prior generations where you could find a stable life at work in one of those jobs that you mentioned, you could be middle class, you could have a family life outside of your job and perhaps find some of your meaning there. Now that is not necessarily an option anymore. You're scrambling with three different jobs and maybe mm -hmm. one from an app and trying mm -hmm. to make your rent in all these different ways. And so I think that breeds discontentment. Those structural conditions are not something that we will be able to address on an individual level. David, if you're an employer, though, mm -hmm. and you want to try to infuse those, let's just call them like repetitive jobs or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. It's something you're going to do this thing. You're going to do it a thousand times in the course of a day, assembling a car, whatever it is. Sure. And it's, it, it, you know, it's it, mundane. It's mundane. It yeah. doesn't check off too many creative boxes. Mm -hmm. As an employer, how do you make that work more meaningful? I'll give you an example from my own experience. I mean, I have a, a subordinate who works for me who his, his job is to schedule 300 courses a year in my program. Now, that's a, a pretty, could be a pretty mundane job. But what I do is try to instill in him how important it is that he does his job well. Because doing that job well means that our students are having a great experience. They're getting the courses they need when they need them without conflicts. And so it's important for as much as possible for these types of jobs to try and instill a sense of meaning uh, for to, to that people can grab onto and say, okay, this is why this job is important. And that gets them through, you know, having this mundane task that might be very, very uh, simple, uh, but, but very, still very important. Now, in the 1970s, uh, two researchers, Hackman and Oldman, came out with something called the job characteristics model. And I teach it to this day to my students. And it's a model of job enrichment to find ways to make jobs more interesting, find ways to allow students, allow employees to, to have uh, integrate a number of different skills, take responsibility for their work, get feedback, and have meaning into their work. And that is, that, those are the kinds of things that we can do that lead to more satisfaction, more happiness, and ultimately more perform greater performance. Yeah. Stephen, essentially our discussion has been leading to this mm -hmm. question, which is who is re ultimately responsible for an employee's happiness? I think it's both today. I really do. And again, uh, like, like Tara said, and Emily Amanda said, with social media, having an iPhone, it's 724, depending on the type of work you're doing. Um, yeah, bigger companies that have a bigger budget are certainly uh, helping uh, with a lot of issues today that, that didn't come up 20 years ago. Um, but again, if, if a candidate is not happy, an employee is not happy, what do you do? Well, you mentioned social media there. How, do, how has social media changed the state of play of what we're discussing? Social media is, is a big state of play, um, and especially today with Google reviews and Instagram and Facebook. If someone's not happy at a job, it could explode, and it can get out there, and it could be devastating. It may not be devastating, but I think the best thing to do is, uh, is talk to your colleagues, talk to your HR department, and basically make sure if this is not a job that you're happy with, maybe it's time to move on. Can you give an example of that? How, how can it get devastating and for whom? Well, today I think there's a lot of people that want to climb up the ranks, especially maybe the younger generation, maybe people with uh, mental health issues that are afraid to ask for help. And I think this is a great thing today where, where our economy has changed. Uh, HR departments have changed. Um, again, um, 
if, if you're afraid to ask for help, what do you do? Mm. Well, that's the question, what do you do? And, uh, and it's very sad to see the outcome of these situations that could happen. Well, I'm gonna talk about asking for something else. And Emiliana, I wonder whether asking for a raise and getting it, doesn't that deal with a lot of these issues around happiness? If you get paid more, you're happier, no. period. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, in an immediate and short-term sense, absolutely, it feels great to tie your sense of accomplishment to a direct and explicit reward like greater payment or, or some kind of bonus. However, over the long term, salary levels, bonuses, they really aren't as powerful at um, inspiring a sense of enduring meaning or purpose or motivation or ultimately happiness in the workplace. Um, there's a great study done by Dan Ariely where he either gave people money, a bonus, or he had the boss call them up on the phone and say thank you and really describe how their work benefited the company and the other people who the company was serving. And he looked at productivity, looked at how hard those people worked. And the day after, the one day after the bonus or the call, both groups' uh, performance went up. They both um, improved. But two days later, the people who got the monetary bonus, there was also a free pizza condition, their performance went back down to actually below the baseline. Mm. People who got thanked, their performance maintained and stayed high. So there's something really unique about that sense of meaning, the extent to which we're contributing to something beyond ourselves, the extent to which that's being recognized by the company and the leaders in the company. That really matters to our sustained happiness at work more than than just how much we're getting paid. Of course, if we're getting paid rock bottom wages, the whole equation shifts. And if people are miserable because they can't make ends meet, that's a different kind of challenge to happiness. So you're talking about all things being equal. And I know when I asked the question here, David, you immediately said under your breath, no, no. Uh, Emiliana is uh, exactly right. I mean, uh, the, uh, the increase in pay is a short-term short -term motivator, but it is about, and one of the things that we forget when we're working with other people is the power of simply recognizing their work and praising them for their work. Hmm. That is such a strong motivator. And money is not a motivator, as Emiliana said. Only, money is only a strong motivator when people feel like they're getting less than they should, when they're comparing to others. Mm. That's when it becomes a strong motivator. Otherwise, hmm. all of these other things are much more important for long-term satisfaction and hmm. happiness. Mm -hmm. Stephen, do people who <laughs> are getting their first jobs, these entry-level employees today, do, do they see a set of circumstances where they understand that sacrifices today will equal long-term better career in future? The smart ones would, uh, but again, there's always a, a candidate out there that might expect something faster. So what do you, what do, you do when you want it faster? You, you work harder, you find out what the, uh, the, the company is doing, maybe outside of work, inside of work, what type of, uh, um, I guess we could say, what type of activities I go through in a social network, in a, in a good company, that always carries a lot of weight as well. Um, T time, time is of the essence, and sometimes I find uh, if, if somebody's not really, really willing to put that time in, then it's time to move on, like hmm. I said. It's time to move on. Leverage your career. Tara, let me just mm -hmm. finish your story, because we mm -hmm. pointed out you were very happy doing what you mm -hmm. were doing, then you stepped away for a while. Yes. So bring us up to date. So for a couple of years, I spent time researching kind of the big issues of our age, the, the issues that are pointed to with this discussion. And I also got a travel grant, so I traveled a bit in the world and talked to people who were resisting overwork and also read probably 300 books, uh, related subjects. You did. I did. So I had a real um, opportunity first of all, to unplug from the hectic day-to-day -day work world, and also to follow my curiosity and interview a lot of people. And what I was hearing from people time and time again is that this pace that we're working at is unsustainable. People are exhausted. That the- uh, uh, Unsustainable over what period of time? Well, over uh, over the length of a career. I mean, I, I think you can push for a certain amount of time. Maybe, maybe you can push for 10 years, or if you have a really strong constitution, maybe you can push for 15 years or 20 years. But at a certain point, if you're working 12 hours a day, as many of us are, and not taking lunch breaks, and kind of scrimping on vacations, and perhaps not finding time for the things that we know that really sustain people's health, 
health, which is social connections and exercise and time in nature, that the overall society is not just the individual, but the overall society is starting to break down as a result. And so I find that really alarming. And I think that we're hitting a very critical point in, in history. How have you changed your life accordingly? Well, for me, what was the most important thing was um, to your point about meaning and purpose. Mm -hmm. The most important thing for me is to understand that we are all in this together. I did go back to the newsroom because I, that is where I feel the most useful. But I have also done a lot of individual things as well as looking at the big systemic issues like making sure that I get proper sleep and exercise and meditation and all the things that we know that do help on an individual level. But the individual level is not enough. I feel that I need to be involved in these bigger systemic conversations on issues like unpaid overtime, for example, that create conditions where it's very difficult for individuals to find human happiness. Uh, I would make a smart aleck observation here that I don't know how you can work in a newsroom and, and still get adequate sleep <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, at the same time, because I don't. <laughs> it's an excellent point. I've never it's been able to figure point. that one out. <laughs> Anyways, let me let me read this. This is from your book, uh, which is coming out in March. It's called "Lean Out: A Meditation on the Madness of Modern Life." And uh, just apropos of what you said, here's a, a quote from the book: uh, "Connecting the dots on the epidemic of overwork and anxiety had not led me to unplug from society, leaving a trail of helpful tips for readers in my wake. It had instead led me here to the most pressing issue of our time." inequality. Underlying every single issue that I'd explored was the reality that we live in a massively unequal society. Can you talk about how you, it's obviously everybody's heard about the book Lean Out, you're talking about, or excuse me, everybody knows about the book Lean In, you're mm -hmm. talking about leaning out, and the issue of, of income inequality. Put it all together for us. Yeah, so I, it's, it's a big leap to make, and let me kind of walk you through how, how I came to this conclusion. So uh, the, the ethos that we're dealing with right now with work is really originating in Silicon Valley. It's this idea that our job is our life and that working these long hours has some sort of um, moral imperative to it. And what I discovered interviewing people and doing the research is that um, we've really undergone a productivity revolution in the last 30 years. We are way more productive than we used to be on the job. Add to that, we're working much, much longer hours. But we know that wages are stagnant. And so all of that value that our increased productivity and our increased hours is generating is not equally distributed. And so people are finding it harder and harder to make ends meet. And that creates a lot of stress, particularly with things like precarious work and the gig economy and rising rents being a huge factor. So you have people that are being squeezed and squeezed and squeezed. And that that value that they're producing on a daily basis is not going into their hands. And so when you look at stats in Canada, for example, I mean, if we think about the states, we, we know that those are very dramatic statistics on income inequality. But Canada is not, um, this dynamic is happening in Canada as well. So over the last 30 years, 90% of Canadians' income has gone up 2%. The top 1% has gone up 160%. And when I started looking into income inequality and what that means to a society, you find that any social index, any way of measuring the health of the society plummets. Everything from infant mortality to literacy to murder rates to domestic violence, anything in the society that you can measure plummets. And so I think that's what we're seeing right now. I want uh, Emiliana to come back into the conversation here and talk to us about an acronym that you quite like, PERC. Tell us about what yeah. that's about. Yeah, well, we wanted to organize the extant, I don't know, field of ideas that are out there about what is most important for happiness at work. And not to make some kind of claim about this is the best, but it is certainly memorable because people are used to the idea that a perk is something that you would consider in looking for a place to work or, or considering a job opportunity. Perks are usually, you know, free lunch, um, flexible working options, vacation time, health benefits things like that, we uh, came up with four main ideas that we think uh, are really essential for supporting somebody's capacity to experience happiness in their job. P stands for purpose, E stands for engagement, R stands for resilience, 
and K stands for kindness. And there are a host of ideas underneath each one of those terms that relate to them that can be worked on, that a person can, can strengthen or that a company can support in order to really help people discover more happiness at work. So yeah, the PERC framework for happiness at work is what we teach in our Foundations of Happiness at Work online course. Well, follow up if you would. Why did you land on those four in particular? Well, when I started to really uh, teach myself about happiness in the workplace, I was originally somebody who was an expert in human happiness in general. And um, when people said, well, what are you going to talk about next? It became quite clear that, again, we spend so many hours at work, and it's a, a part of our lives that people didn't expect or really consider uh, critical or crucial in terms of human happiness, when in fact, just by nature of time and how we spend it and what our bio biological systems do when we habitually engage in one kind of feeling, it became clear to me that happiness at work mattered. And as I began to review the literature, I just noticed that there were lots of different specific ideas. We've talked about meaning and purpose quite a bit in this conversation. Um, the Gallup reports often focus on engagement. Uh, resilience at work is an idea that you see published about when people can't handle setbacks or people struggle to cope with failure or uh, actually oftentimes personal issues that come into the workplace regardless of whether a workplace is willing to embrace that, which often they're not. Often there's this notion, leave your baggage at home, which can be quite harmful. And then lastly, kindness, which is really probably the most um, original contribution from the Greater Good Science Center because our focus in general on well-being is on how important our supportive, trusting, benevolent, cooperative relationships are to our health and well-being. And what we argue is that stands to be the case in the workplace also. When people trust their colleagues, when they share knowledge, when they work together willingly, when they support one another through the difficult times, you're way more likely to experience happiness at work. And those things are really easy for an individual to work on and also pretty cheap for companies to invest in. It's not a really expensive ordeal to create a climate or a culture of friendliness and supportiveness. So um, that's really how we came up with it. We, we, we saw a field of ideas and thought, let's try to organize these in a way that's memorable and then give people specific steps and practical ways that they can strengthen um, some of the skills and affordances underneath them. And, and really realize greater happiness at work. Well, I'm going to pull a little audible here, and that is given that uh, there was an NFL playoff game not too far from where your university is uh, this past weekend, and you've got another one next weekend, Emiliana. Uh, the San Francisco 49ers are having a very good season. I want to put this to David. You know, mm -hmm. uh, I, I watched a lot of football this past weekend, and the one before that too, and so did a lot mm -hmm. of people. And um, I don't think we necessarily saw a lot of kindness on the sidelines when teams were behind. Mm -hmm. In fact, there was quite the opposite. There would be coaches getting, <clears throat> excuse me, right in the face of players who weren't doing well yep. and screaming a blue streak at them to get mm -hmm. them to improve their performance. So my question is, okay, purpose, engagement, resilience, kindness, mm -hmm. are those always the tickets to a happier employee and a more effective workplace? Because mm -hmm. I sure saw examples of it this past weekend where it wasn't. I think they're better tickets than the examples of being very harsh and very critical and trying to motivate people through fear. Hmm. Um, I mean, I study the other side. I study uh, deviance in the workplace. I study knowledge theft and knowledge hiding and cynicism. So I do agree that kindness is definitely uh, important to uh, promote in an organization to try and limit that kind of reaction from employees. But I think, uh, you know, the purpose is key. Right, so in, the, in that acronym, purpose is absolutely key because from purpose, all of these other things tend to flow. Um, so giving people, again, as, as we said earlier, uh, giving a sense of meaning about work, what they're doing, and how it fits with the higher order goals of the organization is really, really important for people. So purpose, can, meaning win the Super Bowl, that covers off a lot of everything. Sure. And, yeah. you, know, you, know, I, you know, in the sports world, maybe that's effective. It's not effective in, in, in normal organizational settings, of hmm. course. We can't do that. We can't treat our employees like that. It just is not effective. Well, Tara, sorry, but I've worked in plenty of newsrooms where mm. the news director dressing down employees, oftentimes mm. in front of others, mm. is, is a way to motivate people to do better on the job. Is that allowed anymore? <laughs> I mean, I don't see a lot of that. You know, it's funny that you would talk
talk about kindness today. I was thinking about being in the newsroom when the Iran tragedy uh, mm -hmm. struck this last week, and just the feeling of um, incredible solidarity in the newsroom really helped all of us to get through the real pain of spending hours and hours on the phone interviewing victims' families. And so I actually see a lot of solidarity in the newsroom. I see a lot of kindness in the newsroom among colleagues. Um, and I think the issue of kindness on a broader scale is super important because in the workplace and in society, I don't know how much kindness can exist without justice. Hmm. And I think at the point that we're at right now with work, mm -hmm. I think we need more justice enable, to enable people to interact as human beings with each other at work. So that if people are not so stressed about just finding their rent and you know getting enough to eat and stringing together different jobs, then, then you are able to be kind and generous with other people. But I don't know how much of that you can do if you're really stressed. Mm. We actually haven't said yet the newsroom that you work in. Do you want to say? Oh yeah, that's fine. I work at CBC. Mm -hmm. Which part? I work in Current Affairs. For, any for Metro Morning. Metro Morning, mm -hmm. okay, mm -hmm. which is a wonderful, you got a new host yet? <laughs> <laughs> We're looking right now. It's yeah. working out. <laughs> Matt Galloway has moved on. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, Stephen, let me put this to you. Um, how seriously do you think employers take their role in this equation of making their employees happy? Because clearly we've talked about some examples here today where Many employers don't feel any obligation at all to m make sure their employees are happy. They just want them to do the job. Correct. Uh, I try to deal with the companies in our agency that have a good reputation. I've recruited candidates for company A where they would say, I don't want to work there. They have a bad reputation. Sometimes we can turn it around. Sometimes we can't. So I, I agree with everything that we talked about today. You know, kindness, trying to help uh, their, their employees, like through wellness, uh, memberships to the gym, whatever they can do. Sometimes it's not always about money. It's about going into work, doing your best, walking out that you've achieved something. Mm. But on our side, where we're hunting people to go work for a company that does have a bad reputation, and we know they have a bad reputation, that is very hard to deal with. We have to turn the business down. <laughs> what do you do? Will you steer people away from working at a place that you know is not a happy place to work? Um, when I've had candidates that have had offers, and then they come to me and we're trying to get them placed somewhere else, I'm going to be honest all the time, okay? But again, reputation is everything. And if the candidate has the knowledge and know-how, I think anybody can find out something on a company if they really, really look. What if a company which had a bad reputation came to you and said, we're looking for a CEO, can you, can you place somebody for us? Would oh. you take the deal? Uh, we've done that many times, Steve, and we've actually gone in, if it's a local company, or we've talked to them and we've been 100% straight with the employers, saying, look, this is why people don't want to work for you. You have said that. Oh, yeah. And we've had the phone hang up, or we've had, okay, guys, what do we got to do? Hmm. Hmm. Are there, David, particular work circumstances that preclude happiness at all? Sure there are. I just want to get back to uh, Stephen's point. I mean, hmm. it's great that organizations are offer things like gym benefits, yoga classes, whatever. But if I go to yoga for an hour and I can step away from work and get that break from work, and I come back to a really bad situation, with my boss or the job that I'm doing or my job is really mundane, getting back to your question, all of that goes out the window. So it's really important that the company, mm -hmm. it's great if companies offer this stuff, but don't expect that if, if the jobs themselves are not interesting, they're not meaningful, you're not getting paid fairly, mm -hmm. you're overworked, mm -hmm. that just giving yourself an hour, you know, giving your employees an hour away from it is going to make people happy and productive because it won't. Mm -hmm. So you have to work not only on those perks, but also on the structure of the jobs themselves, the leadership, mm -hmm. and um, you know, the fairness issues that you raise, which are incredibly important. Mm -hmm. Uh, we're down to our last minute here, and can I give it to Emiliana in the hopes that she will uh, offer some advice to all of, them, all of the employers who are watching right now? What's one thing they can do tomorrow when they go to work to make their workplaces a little happier? Yeah, the one thing I would recommend is share some stories with your employees about how the work <coughs> that you do and the work that they're doing is serving something beyond mm -hmm. themselves. How is it serving the greater good? How is it helping other people? How is it doing something to change society for the better? 
or to lead to positive and uplifting experiences or um, intellectually enriching experiences for other people. I really think meaning and purpose hinges on that extent, feeling like what you do matters to something beyond yourself. And those kinds of conversations are really um, the nexus of, of initiating a, a path towards happiness at work. And with that, we thank Emiliana Simon-Thomas, the Science Director at the Greater Good Science Center at Berkeley at the University of California for being on our program tonight. Uh, awfully good of you to join us uh, from California, Emiliana. And to our guests here in studio, David Zweig, Chair of the Department of Management, U of T Scarborough, Tara Henley, look for her book in March, author of Lean Out, A Meditation on the Madness of Modern Life, and Stephen Cardwell, the General Manager at Stephen Cardwell Recruitment. Thanks all of you for appearing with us on TVO tonight. Much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you very much. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.